So my favorite race in D&D is the Halfling. Always has been. Uh, because for me, I, when I was a little kid, it was The Hobbit that kind of got me introduced into modern fantasy. And then it was Lord of the Rings. And then D&D came after that. So uh, when I was just very small, I was introduced to The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And D&D was kind of the personification of that. And my favorite character in The Hobbit was, of course, Bilbo Baggins. Because he's the character that is not just the main character. But also, he's an interesting character. Because he, on one hand kind of wants to stay at home and enjoy the pleasantries of life. A nice drink, a smoke, uh, sitting by the fire, some good food. On the other hand, there's that other part of him that is excited about the idea of adventures. And that's kind of the conflict I enjoy playing with a halfling, this desire for comfort and for song and for rest, played off against this desire for adventure and this curiosity and this desire to explore. Now, when it comes to Kathleen characters, I find that they're incredibly versatile, surprisingly versatile. In fact, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, because halflings are small size, which means that there's some restrictions in what weapons they can use well. Uh, they have static ability score bonuses, uh, so we can't just move them to where we need them to be. They have a smaller movement rate, so then we also have to deal with that. Uh, so with all those things, you would think that halflings would be a very niche race, that we would find a class or two that they're good at, maybe the iconic ones like Rogue, uh, and then that's what they'd be good at, and everything else not so much, but not the case. In fact, if I look at any class in the game, I can look at that and see how a halfling would work well in that scenario. Now, I don't say that halflings are necessarily the best race for every class, but I do think they are amongst the most versatile races in the game. And I'm going to show you how a halfling can be good at any class in the game, so let's get started. So first, let's go over the traits that all halflings share. So the first thing they have is their ability score bonus, which is a dexterity bonus of plus two. So this is awesome. Uh, other than picking your own ability score bonus, this is the ability score bonus I'd want more than any other one. Uh, because it is going to affect our armor class unless we're wearing heavy armor. It is going to affect our initiative. It's going to affect one of our most important saving throws. It's going to affect attack rolls from ranged, from melee, as well as damage rolls for both those things as well. Even those in heavy armor benefit from all those things except for the armor class. So dexterity is going to be the ability score that no matter what class we choose, we are going to want a good dexterity score. Now it does affect how we make that character. If we're going to make a melee character, we need finesse weapons, obviously. Uh, if we are going to be wearing armor, suddenly medium armor maybe is looking better than heavy armor. For any spellcaster, any spellcaster, dexterity is important. Uh, because first off, dexterity is going to boost your initiative. And that good initiative score, if you get to go first, that means that you get to do things like place those battlefield controls or those mass debuffs on the enemies before they get mixed up with the heroes and then you have to worry about friendly fire. So winning initiative with that kind of character is especially important. The other thing is, is because with a spellcaster, you're probably not wearing heavy armor unless you're a certain kind of cleric, then we're going to expect that a dexterity bonus is going to translate to your armor class. And the better your armor class is, the less often you'll be hit. The less often you're hit, the less concentration saves you make. The less concentration saves you make, the less often you lose concentration. And that is vital for any spellcaster. So dexterity is a great choice for a spellcaster. Constitution, really good too. Uh, but dexterity does just as well. So basically, if we're playing a martial class, dexterity might be our primary ability score. And if we're playing a spellcasting class, it'll be a secondary ability score, uh, probably tied with constitution. The next trait that all halflings share is a speed of 25 feet. It's darn those little legs. So they move 25 feet, which makes them slower than most races in the game. And this is something we have to deal with. Now, sometimes we're playing a class, that maybe it's ranged, maybe it's going to be far back, maybe maneuverability isn't that important. So that 25 feet movement might not be a problem. Uh, but for a lot of different builds, it might be a problem because we need to get in close, we need to position ourselves, and then reducing that movement speed might cause complications. But there's two things. First, there's a number of ways to mitigate that problem. And second, halflings suffer less from that 25-foot movement than any other of the small races. Uh, and I will explain why shortly. Uh, get it? 
The next ability that all halflings share in common is Brave. Uh, so all halflings get advantage on saving throws versus being frightened. So the halfling character in the party is braver than the big burly fighter, braver than the muscle-bound barbarian. I love that. From a mechanical standpoint, I like it. But from a thematic standpoint, I love it. This idea that the halfling has that inner bravery that's right under the surface. The next trait that all halflings share in common is halfling nimbleness. So this is the ability that is often underrated. In fact, there's a lot of people who don't even realize this ability exists, even though they've read it and they've heard about it, but then they play and they forget about it. And you shouldn't forget about it. It's really important for a halfling. Uh, so what halfling nimbleness does is it allows a halfling character to move through the square of any creature that is bigger than they are. And that means that halflings can't be blocked by most enemies. Uh, they can move right through them. This is going to allow your halfling to get to where they need to on the battlefield using less squares than other characters. It can often allow them better maneuverability on the battlefield than somebody with a 30-foot movement who doesn't have halfling nimbleness. And remember, they can move through an enemy's square, and as long as they don't leave that enemy's threatened area, then the enemy doesn't even get an attack of opportunity. Uh, this is going to be replacing in many cases what we might do with the Misty Step, and it's also going to really help us in any case where we're playing with an optional rule like flanking. Halflings tend to be exceptionally good at getting at those back guys that are being protected by a front line. And that brings me to the final trait that all halflings share, and the most dramatic, which is Lucky. So Lucky, I mean, just think about the last character you played. Do you remember rolling some ones? I'm sure you do, and it's so frustrating. Well, when you are playing a halfling, you would be re-rolling all those ones. And when I play a halfling, I actually kind of want to roll the ones. I almost get as much satisfaction from rolling a one as I do from a 20, just because the ability to subvert that one is so satisfying. Now, from a mechanical standpoint, what this means is halflings are more likely to succeed on every saving throw. Halflings are more likely to win initiative. Halflings are more likely to hit in combat. Halflings are more likely to succeed at any skill check. And halflings are more likely to succeed at any ability check. Uh, all these things, Lucky affects every single one of them. Every time you roll a d20 in this game, being a halfling boosts your chance of success. That is huge. My only criticism of this trait is the name. Because why would they name it the same as a feat? Because the, now whenever we talk about Lucky, we have to go, okay, Halfling Lucky or the Feet Lucky. And especially if you get a character that has both. And I've played a character with both. And then you're constantly trying to have, differentiate between the two. I wish they had called the Feet Fortunate instead. So let's get into the sub-races of Halfling. The first sub-race for Halfling is the Lightfoot. So if you are a Lightfoot Halfling, the first thing you get is an ability score bonus of Charisma plus one. This is beautiful because mixing a plus two dexterity and a plus one charisma is great for so many classes. It's perfect for playing a paladin, a bard, a warlock, a sorcerer, a swashbuckler rogue. Uh, so there's so many different classes that the Lightfoot Halfling has the perfect ability scores for. Now their racial ability is naturally stealthy. So what naturally stealthy does is it allows the Lightfoot Halfling to use a medium-sized or larger creature as cover for hiding. Uh, now, if you have something like Cunning Action that allows you to bonus action hide on your turn, then this goes perfectly with the Lightfoot Halfling. And it makes the Lightfoot Halfling likely the best rogue in the game. Certainly the best rogue of all the sub-races of Halfling. So basically, between using your cunning action to hide with your bonus action behind a medium-sized ally, and then attacking from hidden every round means that a rogue at level 2 with a lightfoot halfling is going to basically have advantage and sneak attack on every attack roll they make every round, regardless of whether there's cover or not. Now, for other classes, I don't think naturally stealthy comes up nearly as much. Uh, not too bad for rangers, especially because later on they can also hide as a bonus action. But for most classes that are using their action to hide, most of the time you're not going to want to hide behind another party member because that other party member is probably hiding at the same time. Uh, so this is really about using in combat, which makes it perfect for rogues. The next sub-race of Halfling is the Stout. And what the stout gets is, first it gets an ability score bonus of constitution plus one. So we have dexterity plus two, constitution plus one. 
this is the dream team because no matter what class you choose, these are the two ability scores you know aren't going to be dump stats. But when it comes to what classes the stout is going to be best for, it's going to be best for barbarians, it's going to be best for rangers, it's going to be best for fighters, uh, and as far as halfling goes, it's also going to be the best for wizards. Now the racial ability that all stouts get is stout resilience, which is going to give you resistance to all poison damage and advantage on all saves against being poisoned. Uh, now, if you've played D&D a lot, you already know poison comes up a lot. Uh, if you haven't played a lot, just know this is good and it is going to come up. The final subrace of Halfling is the Ghostwise Halfling. And the Ghostwise Halfling gets an ability score bonus of Wisdom plus one. So we have Dex plus two, Wisdom plus one, Right away, we should be thinking about monks, we should be thinking about druids, uh, and frankly, it's pretty good for most clerics as well. Now, if I'm playing a ranger and I'm multi-classing it, this is also the right ability score mix for that as well. For a single class ranger, I'm still better off with a stout. Now, the racial ability for the Ghostwise Halfling is silent speech. So this is basically telepathy. Uh, it uses up your action, but it is telepathy. Now, if you are a druid, this is a game changer because one of the biggest limitations of a druid is you might be wild shaped for hours and hours and you might also be wild shaped through an entire adventure especially if it's something like a dungeon crawl where not a long time passes between a lot of different combats and you cannot really communicate much at all unless you have some other way around it and silent speech is a way that ghostwise halflings end up being excellent druids now for anybody else, being able to communicate telepathically is still useful. So this is an ability that's going to be pretty good no matter what you choose. It just happens to really shine with druids, especially druids that are going to be wild shaping a lot. So I said halflings would be good at any class in the game. So let's just go through them really quick. Uh, the first one is the bard. I mean, obviously halfling's going to make a great bard. You can play a lightfoot halfling, get a plus two to dexterity, plus one to charisma. That's perfect for a bard. You're going to grab a finesse weapon and or a light crossbow and cast spells as well as anybody else. Have a better chance of succeeding on concentration saves than most other races because of the lucky trait. So overall, this is just a perfect fit for a halfling. The next obvious build is the cleric, uh, because with a ghostwise halfling, we can get a plus two to dexterity and a plus one to wisdom. And we would probably be looking at the subclasses of cleric that don't get access to heavy armor, because we're probably not going to want to wear the heavy armor anyway. So that's going to kind of push me in the direction of maybe arcana or light or knowledge or trickery or any of the ones like that. I just finished a campaign where I played a ghostwise halfling trickery cleric and it worked great. So if you're going to go with a spellcasting cleric, you're going to grab half plate, a shield, probably a toll the dead cantrip, and you're good to go. Uh, if you want to play martial, then you probably want to grab something like a rapier or a light crossbow to take advantage of your good dexterity score. Avoid weapons that are going to rely on your strength score. Now, when we play a cleric, we can expect that we're going to be combining a few different things. We're going to be combining some form of either cantrip or weapon attack, which will be just as good at it as anyone because we're going to have a great wisdom and dexterity. Uh, then we're going to have our spiritual weapon, which will be just as good as anybody else uh, because it's going to be relying on our wisdom. And then usually a spirit guardians. And the spirit guardians, the big thing about that is it's concentration and enemies often will target the cleric who's using spirit guardians, which means more concentration saves. And those concentration saves are usually DC 10, so we usually have a decent chance of making that roll. But remember again, if we're playing a halfling, we get to re-roll ones, which means we're going to have a better chance at maintaining that concentration than other races playing clerics, which I think makes ghostwise halflings as good or better than other races when it comes to playing a cleric. The next class we'll talk about is the sorcerer. This one's pretty easy. Obviously, we're going to play a lightfoot halfling, get that charisma bonus so that we can be just as good at spellcasting as any other class. But remember, that dexterity bonus means we're going to be looking at a higher initiative than other sorcerer builds, which means that we can really focus on things like mass debuffs or mass damage, like your fireballs and stuff. So I find that the best kind of sorcerer for a lightfoot halfling is going to be either a blaster or some kind of controller. The next obvious one is a warlock. Again, obviously we're going to play the Lightfoot Halfling, get that bonus to Charisma. Uh, and then remember too, as a warlock, we're probably going to be using Eldritch Blast a lot. Uh, and 
a warlock as they go up in levels can fire more and more eldritch blasts per round so we may end up firing a lot of eldritch blasts especially if we do something like multi-class with sorcerer uh, so that we can start quickening eldritch blasts we may have lots of attack rolls in a round so not only are we going to have as good a bonus on those attack rolls as any other race but because we're re-rolling ones we're going to hit more often than those other races are the next class we'll talk about is the fighter now if i'm playing a halfling fighter I'm kind of leaning towards a stout halfling so they get that bonus to dexterity and to constitution and I'm leaning towards archery. In fact the build I'd probably look at is the hand crossbow using a crossbow expert feat and the sharpshooter feat. So dexterity and constitution is the perfect mix for any archery character and then remember as a halfling we're more likely to hit with those sharpshooter attacks. As for which subclass of fighter I'm going to play there's a few good options for an archery character. I find battle masters make great archers, eldritch knights make great archers, and of course arcane archers make great archers. These are kind of the three standouts, in my opinion, for archery when you're playing a fighter. Now let's talk about monks, because I've been pretty clear that I'm not a big fan of monks, and I don't think monks are overly effective. But if I was to play a monk, I think Ghostwise Halfling is kind of an obvious choice for the race uh, for a number of different reasons. The first reason is Dexterity and Wisdom are the perfect bonuses. So we're getting that plus two to Dexterity, plus one to Wisdom. That's exactly where we want it to be. The second thing is that monks, for some reason, small size doesn't seem to hurt them at all because our unarmed damage has nothing to do with our size. So in previous editions, if you played a smaller size monk, you did less damage. But that's not the case in 5th edition. 5th edition monks do just as much damage. Uh, all the monk weapons, none of them are heavy weapons. So halflings have no problems with those either. Halflings are a little bit slower, but because monks get the bonus to movement speed, then that alleviates that problem. And a halfling is going to be able to make more use of nimble halfling if they're a monk. Now that dex and wisdom bonus, as I said, was perfect because it's going to be adding to your armor class, your initiative, your to hit rolls, your attack rolls, uh, as well as the DC on things like your stunning strike. And finally, if we play an open hand monk, uh, then we will get the ability to knock enemies prone or shove enemies after a successful flurry of blows hit. But the thing about those things when we're doing it with an open hand monk is that we don't have the restrictions on size that we would normally have for these actions. So normally we are restricted by our size on what creatures we can shove. But when we're doing the shove through the open hand monk, that restriction isn't there. Which means that a halfling who is a monk is just as good at knocking over the enemies as a bugbear. So what I like here is not only does it mean that the halfling is mechanically just as effective with damage and shoving and those kinds of things with the monk, but because they're just as effective as the bigger races, it's cooler, right? Because you got this little tiny monk coming in and really beating up the enemies. So Ghostwise halflings might not only be great monks, they might even be the best monks. So the next class we'll talk about is the most iconic one, the halfling rogue. Uh, and the halfling rogue, easy to make. You're going to take a light foot halfling, get that great dexterity, and then the kind of rogue that I would probably go with, for me, my personal preference is the arcane trickster. That's my favorite subclass for rogue. But probably we might want to take a look at the swashbuckler because the swashbuckler can actually make use of that good charisma as well. But the key to the light foot halfling is combining naturally stealthy and cunning action. When you're in combat, you're going to stay close to a party member that is medium size. On your turn, you're going to use that medium sized creature to hide behind using your cunning action. Then you're going to make an attack against an enemy, and because you're attacking from hidden, you will get advantage, and because you're attacking with advantage, you will automatically get your sneak attack. Then the next round, you'll do the exact same thing. What you could do is at the end of your turn, you could make the hide action and then you would remain hidden until the beginning of your next turn which would prevent enemy attacks against you but the issue is if you're hiding behind a creature that creature could move right even if it's an ally they may need to move uh, and if they move then you're going to be revealed so i kind of prefer just doing the cunning action at the beginning of your turn and then make the attack action after that the next class is the druid Again, this is just such an easy fit. The Ghostwise Halfling is perfect for the Druid. The Dexterity and Wisdom bonus just couldn't be better. Uh, and then we are going to take advantage of the lucky trait 
uh, with our attacks and wild shape, with our concentration saves, because a lot of druid spells require concentration. And then that silent speech is going to be useful for you whenever you're wild shape so you can communicate with the rest of the party. I'm playing a ghostwise halfling druid in a Tomb of Annihilation campaign right now, and I have to tell you, it is a very effective combination. This brings us to the next class, and that is Paladin. And surprisingly, halflings make exceptional Paladins. I'll explain why. So if we take Lightfoot Halfling, which is kind of the obvious one, and go with a deck space Paladin, this is what we can do. So this is not a two-handed Paladin. If you wanted to play a two-handed Paladin, that's another race. What we're going to do here is we're going to take medium armor and a shield and a finesse weapon. And then in combat, we should have just as good chance to hit with that finesse weapon as a strength-based character would have to hit with their strength-based weapon. So we get that hit, and once we get the hit, we will use the smites to increase our damage. Of course, our spell casting is going to be improved as well because of our charisma bonus. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the fine steed spell here, because as a halfling, we can get a medium-sized creature as our steed, which means we can get something like a dog. Now, if you've played D&D, &D, then you know that the first D stands for dungeons, because a lot of the time, that's what you're in. You're in dungeons, or you're in castles, or you're in homes, or you're inside. And a lot of the hallways are five feet wide, and there's staircases, and all these things. Most of the time, we play Dungeons and & Dragons. And all of those things do not mix with a horse. So paladins who are human sized and then they're going to ride a horse are going to find there is a lot of the game where they cannot be mounted. But with a halfling, that's different because a halfling can just ride a dog and that's going to give them a 40 foot movement that takes care of that 25 foot movement entirely. Dogs can climb stairs, they can go down stairs, they can go through five foot hallways, no problem. It basically solves all the problems that you would normally have playing a mounted character in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Even if you go into, say, a tavern or somebody's home and you bring along your doggy, that's normally not even going to raise any eyebrows. It's really the perfect mount for this game. Now, as for the subclass of Paladin, doesn't matter. They all work just fine for a Lightfoot Halfling. So the next class we'll talk about is a Ranger. So if I want to make a great Ranger character, and I'm talking mostly about single class Rangers, then I would go with Stout because that dexterity bonus plus the constitution bonus is perfect for us. If we want to multi-class out, we might consider the ghostwise. But if we're going a straight class ranger, keep in mind that ranger spells, all the best ranger spells, don't rely on wisdom at all. So we don't need a good wisdom score. Having a great dexterity and constitution is as good as it's going to get. So if we want our ranger to go sword and board, we can do that. We can do medium armor, shield, and then grab something like a rapier. Uh, and if we want to go range, we can do that. We can do a short bow, or we can do a hand crossbow and the crossbow expert feat. You're going to focus on dex and con, and grab a good medium armor. You might grab a breastplate if you're going to focus on stealth, or a half plate if you're going to focus mainly on defense. Uh, then we're going to pick up our good skills that rely on dexterity that we are good at, so we can do things like acrobatics and stealth are going to be really good for us. As for weapon damage, we're increasing that damage with Hunter's Mark, so that does fine for us for damage. And then, if for example you're playing a Beastmaster Ranger, I might suggest taking a look at the Pterodon, because the Pterodon is a medium-sized creature, it fulfills the requirements of the Beastmaster Ranger, but because it's a medium-sized creature, as a halfling we can use it as a mount. So we can get on it, fly up, and then rain down arrows from above. It's really one of the most effective builds you can do with the Beastmaster Ranger because the maneuverability is next to none. And being able to fly in Dungeons & Dragons by third level is a pretty big deal. So let's get into our two least obvious classes, the Barbarian and the Wizard. So we'll talk about the Barbarian first. So with the Barbarian, what we're going to do is we're going to make a dex-based Barbarian. So we're going to play a stout halfling, and we're going to focus on our dexterity and our constitution. So the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to improve our armor class more than it would with any other class. Because a Barbarian, if it's not wearing armor, gets to use both its dexterity and its constitution for its armor class. But if we focus on dexterity rather than strength, we're going to be doing less damage with attacks. So what we want to do is we want to focus, and we're going to focus on defense. This is going to be a tank character. It's going to do okay damage, but the main thing it's going to do is it's going to make everyone else in the party a lot better. So as a stout halfling, we're going to have the great dexterity, we're going to have the great constitution, uh, so we might as well benefit from both those, and then we might as well throw a shield on there too. 
Now we're going to have a very strong armor class right from level 1. Really, our defense is unmatched at first level because we probably have an armor class of 18, 15 hit points, and the ability to get resistance to three kinds of damage. And this is all at level 1. Have fun bringing this tank down. Now, Path of the Ancestral Guardian is the key here to turning this into the ultimate tank. So we're going to go ahead and grab ourselves a finesse weapon. We're still going to use rage, but we're not going to use reckless attack. We're going to go into combat, get close to those enemies, hit him with that finesse weapon. It's not going to do as much damage. That's okay. As soon as we hit them, it makes it harder for them to attack anyone else in the party. So now they're basically forced to attack the barbarian that didn't use reckless attack. So it's not easy to hit, has a ton of hit points, has resistance to the damage you do. But if you attack anybody else, you have disadvantage. And although you're not the best at doing damage with this build, you still have just as good a chance to hit as anybody else. And with two attacks at level five, you can pretty much expect to hit most around you attack. So that's the build I would go with if either the rest of my party is mostly fragile or mostly play non-melee characters. If more characters in the party are melee and not as fragile, then I would probably go with Totem of the Wolf. Because if we go with Totem of the Wolf, we can grant automatic advantage to all our melee allies. So the Hexblades, the Paladins, the Rogues, the Great Weapon Masters, they're all going to see significant offense boosts from having you beside them. And Nimble Halfling is going to get you in the place that's going to be within five feet of more enemies than any other race is going to allow you to do. Great thing is, is you don't even need to hit your enemies for your allies to get these great offensive bonuses. But the thing is, with a halfling barbarian, what you have to remember is you're there to boost your allies. That's a little bit counterintuitive for a barbarian. In most cases with a barbarian, you think of it doing just this massive damage. Uh, with a halfling, your job is to make everyone else better and harder to hit. You're going to just be that rock that's making everyone better, but the enemy just can't get rid of you. Now, no matter what of those you play, make sure you have proficiency in acrobatics because a grapple could really mess you up. So the final one is the wizard, and the wizard is basically probably the worst one for halflings. Uh, but have I done it? Yeah, of course I've done it. Wizards are my favorite class. Halflings are my favorite race. I've played halfling wizards, uh, and they've been just fine. And this is how you do it. So first for subrace, pretty obvious. You're going to play the stout here, get that advantage to constitution and dexterity. These are both important stats for wizards, even if neither of them are intelligence. Uh, and then the poison resistance is good too. Now, when we're playing a wizard, having a high primary ability score is probably less important than any other class in the game. So that's important here. The one class we can't get the primary ability score bonus for is the class where that it's the least important to get that. So the key here is it's all about spell selection. Wizards probably rely less on their primary ability score than any other class in the game, and that's because so many spells that they have on their list that are amongst their best spells don't rely on their primary ability score. Uh, so we are going to make selections that focus on those spells. Uh, so spells like right from first level, Mage Armor is a good choice, Shield's a good choice, Sleep is good as an offensive choice. Uh, as we move up in levels, buffs are always good choices, things like Polymorph. Uh, battlefield Controls are always good choices, things like Wall of Force or Wall of Stone. Uh, summoning Spells are always good choices. If we want attack rolls, then Animate Objects is a good choice, Bigby's Hand is a good choice. Utility spells work just fine. So there's actually a lot of different kinds of spells that we can use that are still going to be really effective even without a high intelligence score. Now, there's going to be some spells that we're going to take that are still going to provide saving throws. Am I still going to take Hypnotic Pattern? Yes. Am I still going to take an Attack Cantrip? Yes. Are they going to be worse because I'm a Halfling? Yes, they will. On the other hand, I'm going to make more Concentration saves because I'm a Halfling. I'm going to win more initiatives because I'm a halfling. So there are positives there to offset that as well. So overall, as a wizard, although I wouldn't say halfling is amongst the best races in the game for a wizard, I think it does work just fine. So that's every class in the game. That's how you can make a halfling effective in any class in the game. And I love halflings, so I love the ability to be able to make a halfling anything I want to make it. So. Until next time, I'm going to sit back and relax, and I'm going to have some fun, because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you next time.